right, good morning, everyone. Go ahead, have a seat, and welcome to church today. We're so glad that y'all are here. I mean, it's a great day anytime we get to gather in the house of God with the people of God. But today is an awesome, awesome day because we've got 12 baptisms today. Can we celebrate that together? In fact, I just want to tell you kind of how this happened. We didn't really uh, advertise this. This it, it was a little bit spontaneous. Uh, last week after third service, I had a gentleman uh, come up to me, and a couple years ago, they found out that he had a brain tumor, and he had surgery to get it removed, and this week, he's celebrating two years of God healing him through that process, and he said, you know what? I've made a decision to follow Jesus, and I, I thought it would be awesome on this two-year anniversary to get, to get baptized, and he said, and I've got my two daughters. They want to get baptized. Would you mind just setting up the baptistry for us? And I was like, that's absolutely worth it. Yes, we'll set it up for you. And then we kind of just were like, let's open it up, see if there's anyone else. And as it turns out, there's a lot of people who have made the decision to follow Jesus and we're waiting for an opportunity to take a step of faith, which is how we landed this morning with 12 people. We're like, you know what? I'm ready. I've made a private decision in my life but that decision to follow Jesus is not a private thing. It's meant to be lived out publicly in a very, in a very open way. And that's what baptism is. Baptism in itself doesn't save you. That, that saving work of Jesus happens when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. That's when we're saved. But when we get, when we get baptized, we're just showing publicly what's happened privately. As we go onto the water, we're showing that we have died to ourselves. And as we come out, we're showing like, hey, this is my new life and I am fully alive in Jesus Christ. And so today in this service, I think we've got four, three. We got three for you. And so Pastor Kent, go ahead and kick us off and welcome. All right. Welcome my friend and brother in Christ, Michael Santos. So a few months ago, Michael came up to me after one of our services and said, uh, Pastor Ken, I'd like to uh, have somebody that's going to keep me accountable in my life. And I said, um, you want me to do that? He said, yes. And so we decided we would start meeting and going through the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we've done that. We started anyway. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 16, Jesus is with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And all around Caesarea Philippi, there were gods and shrines and all over the world. And what Jesus was wanting to know is what people thought of him. And he said, so what do people think of me? He said, well, some think you're John the Baptist, others Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus turns, and this is the most important question anybody can ever answer. Jesus turned to his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, who's the spokesman of the disciples, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That means you are the Messiah that came to die on a cross for our sins and save the world from sin and judgment and hell. And so, Michael, I want to ask you the same thing. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. And do you take him today to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes.
welcome my friend Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie has been serving and she's plugged in at renovation for a few years now. But over the last year, she's had a lot of spiritual growth. God's been working in her heart and in her life. Uh, and recently she messaged me and she said, hey, I just realized something out of nowhere. I was sprinkled as a baby and something just clicked this week. And she was like, I wanna be baptized, how Jesus said to be baptized with full immersion. And so maybe that's your story. Maybe you're thinking, I don't, I don't know that I've actually been baptized the way the scripture says. And this was Mackenzie and she had that. And so Mackenzie, I just have a question for you. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? All right, come on, stand up. We're gonna keep praising and celebrating today. That's awesome. What you just saw for these three people, that's the fruit of somebody's labor in the Lord. Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, that's the fruit. Three people plus the few that were here earlier are now gonna be walking with Jesus. Who's gonna be walking with them? That's the real challenge. Who's going to come alongside those people and take them to the next part of their journey? Is it those that spread out the word so that they would know that they should be doing this? Or is it you? We have to be on board with this. Take the opportunity and do this. Take them on the path that follows Jesus. We're in a series now called Follow Me, where two more powerful words ever spoken by Jesus because when they did when those disciples did they knew he was God they knew it in their hearts and they followed him they found freedom and then they changed the world are you gonna be a world changer you can help these people because they're gonna need people to come alongside of them to help them become world changers my name is Steve Snyder. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so honored that you're here today. Even if you just came to see that, we're honored to have you in the house of the Lord today. Please consider the opportunity that we present on a regular basis to become part of a body that goes out and loves on Jesus and serves people. Okay, and you can do that in a lot of ways. We have uh, QR codes on the backs of some of these chairs. You can use your phone and check that out. We have connection cards to, that can help get you connected. We would love to have you come and serve alongside of us. We just enjoy doing what we can for Jesus. And this crowd is indicative of that. So thank you for coming today. Why don't you uh, grab somebody's hand and shake it, then grab a seat, and we're going to get into God's Word.
All right, well, so glad that you're here today on this uh, incredible Sunday, and, um, and we're in a series right now called Follow Me, if this is your first time with us, and what we're doing is we're coming off of our women's conference, and the theme for that was Follow Me, but also uh, kind of working through a book that David Platt wrote, oh man, it must be like 10, 12 years or so ago now, called Follow Me, and there's a Bible study that goes along with that in six parts, and so we're kind of following that and walking through that as well. Um, I, I've, I've been thinking about this series a lot, um, and really just about some of the things that, that we're talking about and, and the heaviness of, uh, of what it really means to, to follow Jesus. Sometimes um, I get to preach sermon series that are um, more lighthearted. I mean, they're still very, very important, but they're not quite as heavy to preach. You know, sermons like on, you know, watch your attitude or be careful what you say or choose a different perspective or don't be a jerk, things like that, that are a little bit more fun to preach. But when we talk about what it means to follow Jesus and the cost that comes with that decision, it's, it's just, it's different. And on Monday, um, I almost started to feel bad a little bit about the intensity of this series and, and some of the things that, that we've been talking about. And, and quite honestly, I started thinking, like, I hope, I hope people, like, come back. I hope that this doesn't scare anyone away. I hope we can keep growing as a church. And just a lot of, honestly, like, fleshly, kind of earthly things were going through my head. And as I really started to think about it, and I started to read about it, and I started to pray about it, I came to this conclusion. Jesus never called us to make bigger churches, but he called us to make more disciples. A lot of people don't necessarily mean a lot of disciples, but the goal of the church is not to have a lot of people. The goal of the church, what we're supposed to do is to make and produce disciples. That's what Jesus told us to do in Matthew chapter 28. That was, it's what's called the Great Commission. Is he, he told his, his followers to go out into the entire world and to make disciples and, and, and baptize them and, and teach them and, and, and equip them. And so every day I, I've realized I have to wake up and I've got to kill that, that, that fleshly desire that's within me to be liked, to feel like the people around me approve of me because all of my life I have struggled with being a people pleaser and really trying to just make everybody happy with me all the time. But I really had to take a lesson from Paul who so poetically said, for am I not trying to persuade people or God? Am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ I almost have to pray that every day that, that I wake up. And so my goal up here is, is I preach this series, but really as I preach any time, my goal is not to please you in these sermons. It's, it's to please God. My goal isn't to make you like me. My goal is to get you into heaven. And that comes with making a decision to follow Jesus and follow him throughout your entire life because that's what he demands and deserves full-out commitment from you, an all-in kind of surrender. And so that's really what I've, I've been thinking. I know that was a really intense beginning, uh, but I just had to get that off of my chest and really just let you know, like, the rest of this series, um, it's going to be important, but it's, it's just going to be heavy. But I want you to just kind of just stick with it for these next um, five weeks as we continue this, because I really do believe that for some of you, this series has the potential to change your eternal destination, but for a lot of you as well, just beyond that, it has the potential to really just radically transform your life and what it means for you personally to count the cost of following Jesus. Last week, we ended the service by asking a very simple but a very defining question. That question is, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? As I mentioned, a lot of people call themselves Christians. And, and most of the time when someone says, yeah, I'm a Christian, what they mean is like, I grew up in a, a Christian home, my family went to church, um, I, I go to church you know, pretty consistently, semi-sporadically now, I'm a good person, I try to do some good things, I've got good morals and, and ethics and, and, and all that, I believe most of what Jesus said. And so yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. But if you call yourself a disciple, that's like next level. And that's, that's really the difference between a casual follower of Jesus and a radical follower of Jesus. 
Because calling yourself a disciple really means two things. Number one, it means you believe Jesus' words, like you believe what he said, you believe what he taught. But it also means, number two, that you're willing to follow Jesus as Lord, which is totally different. If you just believe what Jesus said, then it's fairly easy to kind of agree with it and then move on with your life and, and do your own thing. But if you believe what Jesus said and you follow Jesus as Lord, that fundamentally changes everything about you from the inside out. It's to believe Jesus in such a way that it just radically transforms your life, every detail of your life. And you would say, Jesus is Lord, he is king, he is sovereign over all of my life. And as a result, I submit to what he says to do, and I go where he says to go. So the goal for all of us collectively is not just intellectual belief, because belief is not enough to get you into heaven. The Bible says even the demons believe, and yet they shudder. And so the goal is for you and I not to just stop with belief, but it's to go forward and to follow him and to be transformed by him, to, to, to fill your mind with his truth so much that it changes everything about you. To know Jesus is to believe Jesus, and to believe Jesus is to follow Jesus, and to follow Jesus is to look like Jesus. And so this morning, we're gonna talk about how we can actually do that. How to get to the point of our lives where we don't just say some Christianese things and do some good stuff, but how do we really be transformed from the inside out? Because as followers, we have to be devoted in our following. In fact, Jesus himself says it like this. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else in your life and live righteously and he's going to give you everything that you need. Would you say that that's you? That you seek the kingdom of God above everything else in your life? Is this, is this the most important thing to you is to follow Jesus, to be devoted to Jesus, to seek first the kingdom of God? So you may be wondering like, well, I don't know. What does it mean to be devoted to Jesus? What, to what extent does that mean? Well, if we go to the book of Acts in the New Testament, we see the birth of, of the church. And in that, we see the first Christians, and we get to see what they devoted themselves to. It says in Acts 2.42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So they were devoted to the things that made them close to God. What they were doing is they were seeking first Jesus and his kingdom and his righteousness, and then God was giving them everything that they needed to do to be effective in their ministry and in their mission. They were devoted to the word of God, to prayer, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. Now, the Greek word that's translated here as devoted, it's, it's a really cool word, and it's in the imperfect tense, and in case you're like, I have no idea what that means, grammar was not my favorite subject, what that means is that it's, it's an ongoing kind of thing, meaning it's not a one-time devotion, it's not a one-time fellowship, it's not a one-time gathering, but it's, a, it's an ongoing, continual kind of a devotion, that's what these disciples had. They had a single-minded, ongoing pursuit of Jesus. Does that describe you? There's a lot of people in the church today, as we talked about last week, that would consider themselves to be a little bit more of a casual follower of Jesus. This is how some of you would describe yourself. It's, it's kind of like, well, I, I, I kind of believe in God, you know, but you're not really gonna see it in my life outside of, you know, at church attendance every now and then. Morally, I try to be a good person. I try to do good things. I try to be nice, but I'm just not radical about all of this. I'm not fanatical, and, and so I don't know if I would call myself devoted or not. Uh, I, I saw an illustration this week that really helped define what does it mean to be devoted to something, and I thought this might help you understand what you're devoted to. All of us have, every week, we have 168 hours every week, and so each of these little dashes represents an hour of your life as you go throughout your week. 168 hours in every single week. Now, if you wanna find out what you're devoted to, you have to find out what do I devote my time to, because what you devote your time to, that's what you devote your life to. 
Now, the reality is for, for most of us, uh, unless you have a, a medical condition like sleep apnea or something, the average person sleeps about 58 hours every week. And so you sleep 58 hours, and that takes up um, about a third of your entire week. And then if you have a job, if you go to school, anything like that, that's another eight hours a day. That's another third of your week. And so you've got, you've got a third of your week that goes to sleep. You've got a third of it that goes to work or to school. And then you've got about a third of your week that goes towards, you know, other things, other activities. Um, if you're on social media, who's on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, any of that? Oh, okay, yeah, I, all of you. That means you spend an average about 17 hours every week, so of your remaining 56 hours, that gets trimmed down even more, leaving you with 39 hours for all the other stuff that you do in your life every week. What is the other stuff? And it's taking your kids everywhere, that's running them to practices and sitting at their games, it's filling up your car tank with gas, it's cleaning your house, it's walking your dog, it's watching TV, working in your garage, cooking dinner, doing laundry, it's, it's all this other stuff. And then what you end up being left with is you're like, well, after all this other stuff, after sleep and work and activities, I've got about an hour a week that's left after everything, and that's the hour I'm going to give to God because I'm a Christian. And a lot of you obviously give a lot more than an hour a week to God. But some of you, you struggle to do even that consistently. And a lot of people, this is what they give to God. They're like, I'm going to give him kind of what's left over. What I haven't filled up with everything else, I'm going to give that to God. And because I give that to God, I'm going to call myself a Christian. Is that the kind of devotion that leads to real life transformation? If you devote an hour of your week to anything, are you really going to grow significantly in that area? If you say, you know what, every Monday morning I wake up and I go to the gym for an hour and that's it. I don't work out the rest of the week. I don't eat right the rest of the week, but I give that one hour. Are you really going to see your body change? Probably not. Uh, if, if you only spend about one hour every week in the same room as your spouse, are you going to say, you know what, I spent an hour with my wife on Wednesday evening, we've got the marriage of our dreams? Probably not, because it takes in more than an hour to be devoted to your spouse. If you say, well, I'm going to study, if you're a student, I'm going to study for one hour a week, you're probably not going to graduate at the top of your class. You'd be lucky to graduate at all, because it's not a lot of time. So if we're only partially devoted to God, if we only spend a little time with God when it's easy and when it's convenient and when our time isn't filled up in some other way, are we really going to grow closer to him in a significant way? Are we gonna transform? I'm convinced this is why so many people fall back into the same old sin and the same old patterns. It's because they're very, very partially committed to God. I'm convinced this is why Christians rarely share our faith, because we're just very partially committed to God. I'm convinced this is why we don't feel connected to our church, it's because we're only partially committed. This is why we're backtracking spiritually. This is why we find ourselves spiritually lukewarm in season after season after season of our life. If we only give God what's left over, we have to ask ourselves, are we really devoted to him? What if God has so much more in store for you than that? Have you encountered God in such a way that he has transformed everything about you, how you believe, how you act, what you pursue, what you desire? Has it transformed your hopes, your dreams, everything about you? John 15 is maybe one of the most important passages in the New Testament it's maybe the most important thing that Jesus actually said about here's how you live a transformed life. Here's, here's what being transformed looks like. Here's what being transformed produces in your life. I'm gonna read John 15, one through 11, and then we're gonna kind of break it down and see what it means for our life today. Jesus is saying this, and this is one of the seven I am statements that he makes about himself. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. But if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Remember how last week we talked about Jesus calling Matthew the tax collector and, and I gave you kind of some deep dive context into like what it meant to be a tax collector in that day? Well, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a cultural dive into vines and branches because there's a lot of you that probably really don't understand the significance of what Jesus is talking about because you're not a Jewish person living in the first century. So it's not gonna land with you the same way it is to the people that Jesus is talking to. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, that's like, it's a phrase that's loaded with meaning. Throughout the Old Testament, that imagery of the vine is always used towards God's people. So in the Old Testament, the beginning part of your Bible, if, if you read through it and you come across imagery of someone or something being a vine, that was always either Israel or it was the people of God. And every time it's used, it's used in a very negative way. Because in the Old Testament, God would say that Israel is a vine, but it was a vine that did not bear fruit. And so if you're, if you're sitting here at the feet of Jesus and he's teaching and he's talking about this vine thing, automatically you're moving to something that's negative because it's always a bad thing. And yet here Jesus is and he's saying this and he's turning it on its head and he's saying, I'm the true vine. Like what he's saying is I am doing what you cannot do. I am producing what you cannot produce. I am what you have not been able to be. You have not been able to be fruitful in a way that pleases God, but I am got you because I'm the true vine. He's helping them understand that no matter how hard they worked, no matter how hard they tried, no matter how good they looked or how much they obeyed, they always fell short. And the same is true for you and I today. No matter, no matter how hard we work, no matter how hard we try, no matter how good we look or how much we obey, you and I on our own are always going to fall short and yet Jesus stepped into their lives and he's still stepping into our lives today saying I've got you and I can produce in you what you cannot produce in yourself because I am the vine. You're not the vine. I'm the vine, and the type of life that pleases God that you have been unable to walk, I now make possible for you. That's, that's what's happening when he makes this seemingly very simple statement, I am the vine. So in this story, Jesus is the vine, who are we? Well, according to what he's saying, you and I are, we're the branch that is connected to the vine, or rather should be connected to the vine. So here's the deal when when you, when you as the branch are connected to the vine, when you're connected to Jesus, what's gonna happen is that as you're connected to Jesus, you're going to bear what the Bible calls spiritual fruit. And what is, what is that? Well, according to Galatians 5, spiritual fruit is things like peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and, and self-control. Like that's, that's the goal, that's, that's the transformation part. So if you're like, well, I don't know if I've been transformed or not, you've gotta look at what are you producing in your life? Are you producing things like peace? Are you producing things like joy and goodness? Are, are you self-controlled? Are you exhibiting these things? Or are you bearing what the Bible calls bad fruit in Galatians? Are you producing anger? Are you producing bitterness? Are you producing a lack of self-control? What is it that you're producing? Because every person produces something, whether that's good fruit or bad fruit. But there's one word that occurs here in this passage, in this translation, 10 different, 10 different times in this section. And, and if we see a word 10 times, that's probably gonna be a pretty important word, right? Well, I mean, when we really go back to the passage and we look at it, we see this word over and over and over and over, abide, 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 abide. If you don't like that word abide, you could switch it out for the word remain. It means the same thing. If Jesus is gonna tell us something 10 times, do you think he wants us to hear something? 
Do you think this idea matters to him? Jesus said, you gotta remain in me, you gotta abide in me, and then I'm gonna abide in you. He said, no branch can bear fruit by itself, but it must remain connected to the vine, and neither can you. You can't bear this kind of fruit unless you remain in me. The word remain, it comes from the Greek word meno, M-E-N-O, and it means to dwell, to live in. This is not just a one hour weekly duty to God. Gotta do my Bible time. Gotta go to church. Gotta, gotta make God happy, otherwise I feel like he's gonna punish me. No, this is a fully committed all in devotion to the one who matters most. You don't have to be a botanist to understand that if a branch disconnects from the vine, what's gonna happen? It's gonna start to die. It might be green for a little while, might have leaves, might even have a piece of fruit for just a little bit, but the longer this branch is disconnected from its source, the quicker it's gonna die. Because this branch, this needs to be connected to the tree so that it can receive the, uh, the nutrients that it, it needs to survive, and so do you. You gotta stay connected to Jesus, otherwise you're not gonna receive that spiritual nourishment that you need to live a transformed life, to produce these kinds of things that Jesus says that you can produce. Are you connected? We have a hard time with this because as we look at the world we live in, there's so many things about our world and our lives that are customizable. And because everything about our lives is customizable in some way, we want our faith, our Jesus, to be customizable as well. If you go to buy a new car, you have a variety of cars to choose from. You can find a car that meets every need you have, every desire you have. It can have every feature that you want it to have. You can get it to be customizable. If you go to a restaurant, you have an entire menu, and normally you can pick and choose what you want, and, and if you don't like something, you can customize it. If you're like, oh, that steak comes with asparagus, I don't want that. I can sub the asparagus for green beans or for mashed potatoes. Normally, if the menu says it, that's the way I get it. I don't want to trouble anyone. My wife has no problem with that. She'll customize everything about her meal, right? But not me. We can customize every single thing that we want in our entire lives. Now, the problem with so many of us is we've wrongly tried to attempt to apply the principle of customation, customization when it comes to following Jesus. And often, without even realizing it, we have a tendency to redefine Christianity according to our own tastes, preferences, church traditions, and cultural norms. And what ends up happening is slowly and subtly, we take the Jesus of the Bible and we twist him into someone that we're a little bit more comfortable with. We dilute the cost of what he said it means to following him. We ignore what he said about those who choose not to follow him. We disregard what he said about living on mission all the time. We pick and choose what we like and don't like from Jesus' teachings, and in the end, what we have done is we have created a nice, non-offensive, politically correct, middle-class American Jesus who looks just like us and thinks just like us and acts just like us and pursues the same things like us. But here's the problem. Jesus is not customizable. He has not left himself open to interpretation, adaption, innovation, or alteration. He has clearly spoken to us through his word, which is living and active and good and perfect. And he has used his word to tell us who we are and whose we are. He has defined us. He has created us, so he absolutely has the authority to define us, to tell us who we are to tell us what we should pursue, to tell us what should be the purpose of our life. And so to follow Jesus is to be conformed to his image. It's to submit to him as Lord. And that's how we find real life transformation. Real life change will not come from our efforts, but it'll come from abiding in Jesus, from remaining in Jesus. So going back to where we ended last week and where we began today, this question that we keep driving, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? And maybe you're like, I still don't know. I'm more confused now than, than when we began this thing. And that's okay. 
we're going to keep taking time every week. We're going to keep digging in, diving in, and seeing, like, what does Jesus say about what it means to follow him? What, is that, what does that look like for our lives? What does that demand from us? What really is the cost? But you have an opportunity to make a decision. I remember growing up in church and thinking that, well, I'm a Christian because I go to church. And I was kind of one of those casual Christians. I believed in God, but I didn't really know him. And some of you are gonna maybe recognize today that that's you, that you're more of a casual Christian. And, and maybe you're gonna realize, like, I end up having to realize that being a follower of Jesus isn't just joining a church, it's not just checking a box, it's, it's an ongoing relationship with him. Or maybe, maybe for you, maybe you used to be connected, maybe you used to remain in Jesus and he would remain in you and, and, and that whole abiding thing, like you were doing that and you were, you were seeing your life change and you were producing fruit, but somewhere along the way of your life, you just got disconnected and now who you were is no longer who you are. You need to reconnect to the vine. Because that's what's amazing about Jesus, right? This stick, when it's done, we're just gonna throw it away and it's gonna be burned because it's not good for anything. That's not you. Your story isn't just that, well, you're no good for anything. You're worthless. You've wasted your life. See, our God is the kind of God that even as he hangs on a cross, that the thief, the guy being crucified next to him can make that decision to say, I wanna follow this guy, I wanna follow Jesus. And at that moment, even though his earthly life was over, his eternal life had just begun. That can be you. Maybe you've made a mess of your life up until this point right now. Maybe it's like, you know what, today I've made every wrong mistake I could make along the way. I have taken every wrong turn. I have gotten off course, but today you get to come back home. You get to reconnect to the vine. You can be transformed. But that's up to you. I wish for every one of you, I wish I could go up to you and just force you to reconnect to God. I wish, don't you, Pastor Steve? I wish that I could help you understand the immense value that comes from knowing God from being connected to God. Because I want you to experience that transformation like I've been able to. And it's not a transformation that leads to a perfect life, but it is one that leads to a fulfilled life. And so today you have an opportunity to connect to the vine, to live a transformed life, to see God radically change everything about who you are by submitting to the simple command, follow me. Would you bow your heads as we go into a time of prayer? Some of you were in here today. And you're like, yeah, I'm I'm a Christian, but I, I could not call myself a disciple. My life, it ain't that sold out. It's not that radical. But it can be. And it should be, and it's supposed to be. That's what Jesus deserves. That's what he demands. And so maybe you've come into this place this morning, and you were like, I am... I am as far from God as I could possibly be. I have been running my entire life in the opposite direction. But as, as David wrote in Psalm 139, he said, no matter where I go, no matter where I run, you're there. The king of the universe desires a relationship with you. It's just powerful to imagine. He's inviting you today. Follow me. Perhaps you've made that decision. Like your eternal destination is secure and you know that. But you have found yourself in a season of life where you feel like you've come disconnected. 
you used to produce some really good fruit, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, love, self-control. But you've taken a wrong turn somewhere along the way. You still have time to course correct. You still have time to come back to your Father and that's what He wants for you. That's that, that abundant life that He has for you. And that abundant life starts with abiding in Him. And Jesus, that's what you want for every single one of us. It's for us, number one, to follow you. And second, it's to remain in you, to abide in you, to stay connected to you. This is what produces transformation. It's not our efforts. It's not our works. It's not our morals. It's not our efforts. It's just you. So today, I pray that you would do what only you can do. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And today, Lord, I submit every aspect of my life to you. I live to please you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand up? We're going to have a time called invitation. And if you're, if you're kind of new to church, um, what we're inviting you to do is to respond not to, to my words, but to the word of God. And we're gonna have a prayer team up front and, and maybe for you, you're like, it's time. <laughs> I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna submit my life to him. And someone on our prayer team, if you would come up during this final song, they would love to talk with you about here's what it means to take that next step. Here's what it means to surrender your life to Jesus. Or maybe for you, you're just like, I'm just going through a really hard time of life. I'm trying to abide. I'm trying to remain, but it's just like the storms of this life just keep hammering me. And you seen prayer that you would stay, that you would remain. Our team would love to pray for you about whatever you're going through. But now is your opportunity, now is your chance to respond.
perfect peace When I draw close, you draw close to me Remain. And don't just do it in the moment. Oh, I want to remain in this moment. I don't blame you. Some of you are ready to get out of here. I don't know that I can blame you for that either. But don't just remain because it's a moment. Remain because it's what God wants you to do. To remain in Him. And let me tell you something. Here's something from the thickness of Romans chapter 2, which is very challenging. Right in the thick of it all, it says this. This is exhortation to all of you. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God. You sit in this, in this space, sitting in this space and listening and hearing does not make you righteous before God. According to God's word, it says the hearers of the law are not righteous before God but the doers of the law will be justified. You need to do it. These people need to have their hands held and, and helped along because then they will do it for somebody else. Amen? Amen. It's going to happen. There will be fruit from your life that you have no idea would ever happen because you made this decision. I'm just honored to stand on this platform and encourage you to take what Pastor Kyle did, which I've already said is way too much meat in one sermon, and do something with it. Don't just put it in the refrigerator and let it spoil. Amen? We love you guys. We want you to be a part of what we're doing, and we'd love for you to help us financially with that, because this is a lot to take on, and we're building upstairs back there. And we can do that and serve the world financially as well by doing this. You can give of your resources, your tithes and your offerings. We'll take that, put it towards what God's doing in his kingdom through this local body. We would love to have you partner with us. Thank you for today. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. Great message. Go and do what God has told you to do. Amen. Have a great week.